The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to his disciples, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you always. Whoever loves me will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our dwelling with him. Those who do not love me do not keep my words, yet the word you hear is not mine, but that of the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am with you. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I told you. The Gospel of the Lord. Now, what you all are unaware of is that one of my favorite all-time football games to watch when I was a kid growing up and I had time to watch football was the Army-Navy game. Oh, baby. If I wasn't watching Notre Dame, I was watching Army-Navy play. And we got something of an Army-Navy thing going on here today. On this side of the church, unbeknownst to you all, and just recently back from the Persian Gulf, is Warrant Officer Grade 4 Max Valasquez. Max, could you stand so they could see you? Remember, we sent him off. We prayed for him back in November. And just so you know, because he was aboard ship in the Persian Gulf, the Iranians backed down about all that nuclear stuff. So thank you, Max, for taking care of the workforce. On this side, representing the United States Army, we've got Lieutenant Colonel Phil Sheridan, whose little girl's going to be making First Communion. Could you stand up? And flanked by him is his father. And this is his father, retired Colonel Sheridan. So we're glad to have you all here. So it's an Army Navy thing. Now, who wins depends on who can answer the 10 questions after the sermon's over, OK? All right. Today, we celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And I must tell you from the very beginning, from the time I was a kid, in fact, most of my life, I could have cared less about Pentecost. What was a concern to me? Well, of course, Christmas, for goodness gracious. Christmas. Who doesn't love Christmas? The Feast of Christmas. Easter, for goodness sake. We just got through celebrating Easter, it seemed like a couple weeks ago. And there was Lent, when I got a chance to have those ashes put on my head and show all those non-Catholic people, you know, what it was like to be a Catholic. And then Advent. But Pentecost? And the sending forth of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Uh, I remember when the pimples popped, like most adolescents, I began to say to myself, prove it. Holy Spirit, prove it. Prove it there's a Holy Spirit. I mean, it just didn't make any sense. It wasn't a tangible feast, so to speak. Until I went to school and I studied the Acts of the Apostles. Now, just so you know, the Acts of the Apostles is the second volume written by the author of the Gospel of Luke. But check this out. Mark will give us the words Holy Spirit five times. Matthew 12. John 15. Luke will give us the words Holy Spirit in his two volumes 73 times. More than all the other books of the Bible put together. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is essential to the church, says St. Luke. That's why so much talk about the Holy Spirit. Now, to appreciate today's feast, we've got to go back to last week's feast, the Feast of the Ascension, and especially in chapter 1, verse 8 of the Acts of the Apostles. Remember, 11 apostles in Jerusalem. Judas has not been replaced yet. Jesus appears to them from his risen state, and he tells them to stay put. Stand pat, he says because a promise from on high is going to come upon you, then you are to be my witnesses throughout Judea and Samaria, yes, even until the ends of the earth. That phrase, to the ends of the earth, which appears also, by the way, in Genesis chapter 12 and in Genesis chapter 15, when God uses those words to Abraham, are essential. Now, what's the ends of the earth, you might ask? Well, back then, it was very simple. 
If you were in Jerusalem, there wasn't a whole lot to the east. There was mountains, okay? So you didn't bother going over there. Nobody wanted to be a mountaineer back then. But the other part of the world was vast. To the west was the city of Rome. And so the belief was if you could somehow make it to Rome, you would then fall off the edge of the earth because there was nothing beyond Rome. Rome was the center of everything, you see. Now, the question is, how are we going to get the gospel from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth? Because the problem is this. Right after Pentecost and all that beautiful talk that we heard in the first reading about the Holy Spirit and people speaking in tongues and all that kind of stuff, then the tough times began. Persecution after persecution after persecution. And what's amazing is that every time there's persecution, the church in one area suffers greatly, it sprouts off to another part of the world and explodes. Thousands of people enter the church there. Where in other words, you get a feeling that it can't be stopped. It keeps growing and growing and growing and growing and growing, even in the midst of human attempts to stop it. But it gets bad. It gets really bad at one point in time. In long about chapter 26, Paul, who had converted from Judaism to Christianity, has been called by God to take the gospel to Rome. He doesn't tell Paul how it's going to happen. He tells Paul that you're going to suffer because of it, but you've got to get the gospel to Rome. And look what happens. Those of you who are lawyers or associate with the legal profession will love this. In chapter 26, there's Paul once again in jail. The procurator, the descendant, if you will, of Pontius Pilate is a man named Festus. If you ever wondered where that character in the Adams family got his name, it's from the Acts of the Apostles, Festus. Festus has put Paul under arrest for his own safety because every time Paul preaches Jesus Christ, the conservative zealot Jews come after him and want to kill him. And Festus says, you know, they're going to rip him to shreds if I don't take him off the streets and protect him. But what do you do with somebody like Paul? You know, Festus could care less about Christianity. It doesn't offend him. It's a nuisance, if anything. He doesn't believe that stuff about Jesus Christ. He really has nothing wrong with Paul. Paul seems to be a nice guy. He talks a lot, but he's a nice guy. And so what is he going to do with Paul? And so he's thinking to himself, you know, if Caesar catches word of this Paul and me allowing him to run his mouth off and cause these riots, I'm going to get out of the job. And so he decides to execute Paul. He has Paul at a hearing, and just as he's getting ready to tell Paul that he's going to have him put to death for safety's sake, Paul speaks up and says, um, excuse me, your honor. But I just thought I'd let you know that, yes, I'm a follower of Christianity, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, but I happen to be a Roman citizen, too. Bam! What does that mean? Well, Paul is entitled as a Roman citizen to have his case heard before none other than Caesar. And where does Caesar live? Rome. And so the rest of the Acts of the Apostles has Paul in chains and shackles, part of the time aboard ship, part of the time in a carriage aboard land, and he's heading to Rome to preach Jesus Christ. And the amazing thing about Acts is in the last chapter, chapter 28, there's Paul walking the streets of Rome in chains and shackles preaching Jesus Christ. Mission accomplished. But do you hear what I'm saying? Paul got the gospel to Rome on a legal technicality. It's amazing. And you know, skeptics will say, well, you know, lucky break for him. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit planned it that way. Because all the walk while Paul's traveling over sea and over land, everywhere he goes, he's preaching and making Christians. It was no accident. Now, that story may impress you, but you may still be skeptical and say, well, okay, I've never cracked open my Bible since First Communion yet, so I'll get around to that and I'll read that, Father Jim, as soon as I pay my quarterly taxes. Well, 
Let me tell you another story that certainly will convince you. I love this story because it describes Pentecost to a T. Once upon a time in the middle of a great forest, there lived an old woman who kept hives of bees. By the end of the summer, she had more honey than she could use. Every jar, every bowl and barrel were filled to overflowing with the sweet golden honey. The old woman kept some for herself. The rest she poured into a great pot, lifted the pot on top of her head, and set off to market. Off she went through the great forest for days with the pot balanced on the top of her head. Just as she neared the marketplace, she accidentally caught her foot on a tree root and went flying. There was a great crash. The pot had fallen and smashed to the ground, oozing the sweet sticky honey all over the forest floor. The woman just sat there and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Oh, misery, she moaned. Papa God, you sent me too much misery. After a long while, she finally got up, trudged home with a heavy heart, crying all the way. Misery, oh misery. Papa God, you sent me too much misery. Now it so happened that a little monkey sitting high above the branches saw the whole thing. As soon as the woman was out of sight, he swung down to the ground. He looked and looked at the strange sticky stuff. He had never seen anything like it before. Cautiously, he dipped one of his fingers into it and touched his lips. Oh my, he exclaimed to himself, this misery's good. I've never tried misery before. He scooped up a whole handful and swallowed it. He ate and ate until he got down to licking the pot until there was simply any more. But oh, there was had to be more, he thought. I want more, he cried. And then he remembered overhearing the old woman saying, Papa God, why'd you send me so much misery? He scratched his head. So that's where misery comes from. Maybe he thought to himself, maybe if I paid Papa God a visit, he'd give me some more misery. And the more he thought about it, the better the idea seemed. So off he went back to the trees and then to the mountains and he climbed and climbed until at last he came to Papa God's house. And there was Papa God himself sitting in the garden just watching the world go by. Beg your pardon, Papa God, he shouted. Papa God turned and saw him and smiled. Ah, oh, little monkey, what do you want? Begging your pardon, Papa God, said the little monkey. More than anything else, I want misery. Papa God looked puzzled. You want misery, little one? Oh yes, sweet sticky misery. I want as much as you can give me, Papa God. Papa God got up, thought a minute, and said, well, it just so happens that I've got some special misery made just for monkeys. Are you sure you want it? The monkey nodded his head in excitement. So Papa God went inside his house and after a spell, returned carrying a leather bag. He said to the monkey, little monkey, this bag is full of misery. Now you must pay attention and do exactly what I tell you. First of all, you must carry this bag to the middle of a great sandy desert where there are no trees and where, in fact, trees can't grow. Then once you're there, you will slowly open the bag and inside you'll find more misery than you ever dreamed of. The monkey was delighted and wasted no time. He took the leather bag and climbed back down to the world and he ran and ran until he came to the edges of a great desert and then he ran and ran some more until he came to its very center. Exhausted, he sat down. His hands were trembling in anticipation of all that misery. So he opened the drawstrings of the bag just as Papa God had told him and out came real monkey misery. Dogs. One, two, three, seven huge big black hungry dogs. The monkey screamed, dropped the bag and ran literally for his life. The seven black dogs were snapping at his tail. They were getting closer and closer and just when he thought he could go no further and the dogs were gonna surely get him, poof, a tree appeared. Out of nowhere, a huge great tree appeared right there in the middle of the desert where trees, of course, do not grow at all. 
The monkey scampered up the tree as fast as he could, leaving the seven snarling dogs leaping up and down from the trunk. And for the rest of the day, he sat in the tree branches, quaking with fear until the sun went down and the dogs, frustrated, eventually slunk away. As soon as they were gone and the monkey thought it was safe, he climbed down and ran for the forest as fast as he could and never one time looked back. Now, the question for Pentecost is this. Where did the tree come from? Who put that great tree where trees don't grow, right there in the middle of a hot, dry desert? That's the meaning of Pentecost. That story comes from the Caribbean. It's a powerful folktale, but one that talks about what Pentecost is all about. Pentecost is where God does what Isaiah 55 says. My ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord. Or to put it another way, when I was working in the city of Baltimore at a large black Catholic church called St. Bernadette's, the gospel choir there sang a hymn, the title of which I will never forget, and it goes like this. I can't believe he brought me this far to leave me. Or in other words, God can make a way out of no way. But that's God. That's how the Holy Spirit works. It's God's power, it's God's presence making the impossible happen. Now, what does that have to do with us? Surprise, surprise, actually no surprise, surprise. If I told you that our world is in a mess, you know that. The lack of civility, the violence, the hatred, the corruption, and so on and so on, and the Catholic Church has its share of the mess as well. But right here in our own country, we've seen abuse after abuse after abuse of power from people that we elect and put into office. For instance, Catholics, the majority of Catholics in this country, the last election, voted for the most pro-abortion president in the history of the church. And, and that's not all, this president on August 1st of this coming year will impose upon the Catholic Church mandates that will require us to do what our teachings forbid us to do and make us pay for it. That's already in place. It's happening August the 1st, and it's going to be devastating. What happened? We just took things for granted, and we focused on issues that really long-term were not the key issues. Protecting human life, the unborn. You heard what that animal did in Philadelphia, killing those little babies that were from botched abortions. That one account I heard just made me sob where they took this one baby that was crying and weeping and breathing and moving and they dumped it in the toilet and let it swim and then they pulled it out after playing with it for a while and snipped the back of its neck to kill it. It was a baby, a human being. That is the kind of barbarism that is happening in our country. This week, shock of shocks, it was reported in the news that the IRS has been harassing and investigating concerns that are of a conservative nature. And guess one of the concerns that's been harassed it was exposed two days ago, Billy Graham. Billy Graham. They went after Billy Graham, of all people, over his tax exempt status. The pastor of presidents he is known. You see, so it's a mess. It really is a mess. But that's not all. The church is in real trouble as well. You know, I've talked to many of you in, in the past year or so, and I hear your frustration, and I hear your hurt, and I hear your embarrassment, and I hear your disappointment. You don't know how hard it was to teach the RCIA this year to these good people who were seeking the truth of the Catholic Church when all the while I had to tell them also about the abuses in the church, the scandals, the sexual abuse, and the way that so many of the leaders of the church, priests, bishops, cardinals, archbishops, are living in opulence while their people are struggling to make a living. 
sometimes it's so easy to lose hope. We think perhaps that the Lord is just not anywhere to be found. But Pentecost says, yes, he is. Now, I will tell you something right now. There is a huge movement of the Holy Spirit. I am so absolutely convinced that the Holy Spirit is working in the world and especially in the Catholic Church. I'm convinced more of this than anything I've ever been convinced of other than the presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And it all centers in two things. Pope Francis. There is a reformation underway. There is a reformation happening in the Catholic Church. And you can trust me, it is underway and it is inspired by God. Do you remember when this man got elected Pope? What's the first thing he did? He refused the gold-laced vestments when he went out to meet the people at St. Peter's Square. He had on a plain white cassock. And you know the first thing he did? He bowed and asked the people to bless him. That's never happened in history. Never happened. He is going after the upper echelons of the church. As I shared with you last week, so many of his statements have gone after the hierarchy of the church, the leadership of the church. What do I think he's doing? I think he's trying to shake this tree at its roots. He's trying to go after it. Listen to something that he said just this past week when he was talking about wealth and finances. Never dreamed I'd hear this. When a priest or a bishop goes after money, the people do not love him, and that's a sign. St. Paul did not have a bank account. He worked. And when a bishop or a priest goes on the road to vanity, he enters into the spirit of careerism. And this hurts the church very much and ends up being ridiculous. He boasts, he is pleased to be seen, he's, he's happy to be seen as all-powerful. And people do not like that, says the Pope. Wow! If that's not a scathing attack, I don't know what is. Now why is he doing it? I can tell you exactly why. He said it a week ago. He said, we are afraid as Christians of the word shame. Shame. And I remember when I was studying psychology, we were never t told to use the word shame when you counseled someone. That's a bad word. That's a bad word. You know what Pope Francis said? That's a healthy word. Because until you feel sorrow and shame for what you are doing that is wrong, you will not turn your heart around and convert. And so he's saying to the church leadership, me, bishops, cardinals, archbishops, shame, shame, shame on you for living like that. Repent, turn your life around, and stop being a career person. You are a person who is called to witness to Jesus Christ and give your life for Jesus and his people. So the first part of the Reformation is underway, and it's huge. It's huge. But the second wing of the Re Reformation, if you will, involves each of you in the pews. You are all called to do your part. Listen to some of the things he said about people in general. This week, he said, the church needs believers with zeal, not couch potato Catholics. He says, the church needs people with apostolic zeal who are willing to preach uncomfortable words of Jesus Christ. And if we annoy people with this zeal for Christ, then blessed bless be the Lord, he said. He said, you know, when Paul, when you look at Paul in the Acts of the Apostles, he said, Paul is a nuisance by his preaching. His work and his attitude, the Pope said, because he proclaims Jesus Christ. He says, evangelization makes us uncomfortable as Catholics. Many times we go beyond our comfort zones. And he says, if you go behind your comfort zones and you are bothered, blessed be the Lord in the process. God wants people who always move forward, he says, even despite the trials and obstacles and not to take refuge in the easy life or in a cozy world. And listen to this. He said, St. Paul was not a man of compromise. No, 
The truth goes forward, proclaiming Jesus Christ must always be rooted in the truth. Wow. No compromise. How many times priests and bishops and others chose to tune down their words so as not to offend their people? That's not a problem with me, as you know. Why? For a selfish reason. The salvation of your souls is what I'm going to be judged on. Read Luke chapter 17 verses 1 through 3 and you'll see what I mean. I am called to preach the word of God to you in and out of season. The stuff that delights your earlobes and the stuff that challenges you at the level of the heart. And if I'm a nuisance to you, if I shake you up or worry you, or if I anger you, then know that the Holy Spirit is talking to you at the same time. That's very important. Listen to this other statement. This one just blew my mind. Using a phrase from Latin that translates literally as the face of a pickled pepper, Pope Francis said that when Christians have more of a sourpuss than a face, that communicates the joy of being loved by Christ. The harm they do because of their sourpuss face affects the witness of the church. I never dreamed I'd be hearing the Pope of the Universal Catholic Church talk about sourpusses. And believe me, I've had plenty walk out of the church through the years. Guess what? The Pope says, if you really have faith, if your faith is solid, then you have peace. And when you have peace, then you have joy. And it shows on your faith. So my brothers and sisters, the Holy Spirit is hearing the plea of God's people. A true reformation in the church has begun. From the top and from the bottom and all in between. My prayer for all of us is this. Do your part. Stand up for the true faith and do not compromise it. You know that when you are doing Jesus' work, it's going to cost you. People will laugh at you. They will hate you. They will do all sorts of things to you. That's the key indicator that you're doing what God is calling you to do. So my brothers and sisters, may the Lord's world and the Lord's church be returned to him as he intended it. And may that happen because we are uniting our hearts with Jesus Christ.